Okay, so let's start again. Um, now, as I told you before, I want to. I, I initially wanted to tell you about both how optimization solvers for continuous and combinatorial optimization work. Since I only really need the first part, so continuous optimization methods, that's the only part I will uh, tell you about, uh, given the time constraint that we have. So, uh, if you want to know how combinatorial solvers work, you'll have to ask me at the break or sometimes. So this new presentation is about this, it's about how continuous optimization solvers work. And actually, there are two parts of this. The first part is really how they iterate, which is not very complicated. And the second part, which is, which is more tricky, is how they stop. OK, so the step one is about the iterations. And the second part will be about when to stop your solver. And it's uh, more tricky than it looks like. So the, let's go with the first part. So again, we, have, we are back to our initial abstract optimization problem. So we want to find some x bar, which minimizes function f. And you have all these constraints, inequality, equality. And from, the, from a very abstract viewpoint, it goes like this. So you start from an iterate. So some guess for uh, the solution. Let's call it x0. Then you have a loop. And the loop will evaluate x at other points. So x0, x1, x2, etc. At each of these points, you will ask uh, software code, a piece of software code, to evaluate function f. And as I said before, the gradients and sometimes higher derivatives of all the functions involved, so f, g, and h. And then you will have a rule that computes x, n plus 1. And then you will loop and loop and loop. And then you have to stop. So if this new point x satisfies some test, then you stop the algorithm and return x, uh, the, your current x, as the approximate solution. So it's uh, you know, pretty abstract and simple. Uh, but it raises a lot of questions. So how do you choose all these things? So how do you choose a rule to update x? And how do you choose a rule to stop these iterations? So the ingredients for this method are the following. So first, you need the piece of code that will take x as an entry, as an input, and return the evaluation of f, g, and h, and hopefully some of their derivatives. That's what we call the oracle, or you can create a simulator if you want. The oracle is a piece of so software that does just that. The update rule is the one that tells you how to iterate from your current x to the new x. And what it does, it, use, it uses the information you have so far to build what we call the local model of the objective function and constraints. So um, if you are the solver, you don't really know all about the objective function and constraints. All you know is information <coughs> at some points. So the function itself, the entire information is hidden in the oracle. And the oracle only told you about the value and hopefully derivatives of f, g, and h as at point x0, x1, x2, and let's say until x10 if you are, if you are at the 10th iteration. This is all the information you have from the solver's viewpoint. And what you want to do with this is guess what the function looks like. So what we, call it, we call it building a local model. And with this guess, you say, OK, I think the function looks like this. So if it really looks like this, then I should try a point there, and this is what generates your new iterate. And then you, you will ask the solver, you will ask, sorry, the oracle to evaluate all the functions and then derivatives at this new point. And the stopping crit crit criterion is what uh, tells you to stop. And the, what we really would like to do is to use some necessary and sufficient, sufficient optimality condition. So if we had one, we'd say, OK, this criterion, this, this equation tells me that this is an optimal point. We usually don't have this. What we do have is a necessary optimality condition in general. So we can say, OK, if a point is a solution, then it should satisfy these equations. And that's what we use as a stopping test. So sometimes it's possible that we stop at a point which is not optimal, because we only have checked a necessary condition and not a necessary and sufficient condition. But that's the best we can do. Now, before I go further, one uh, comment about the first iterate. 
So x0, um, you either choose it, choose it arbitrarily if you have no idea where the solution is, or if you have a good solution, you can use x0, you could use this good solution as x0. If you have this uh, good known solution, it can be very useful because it can reduce computing time for some methods. I should have added that, I didn't, it's a mistake. Some methods are very well suited for what we call warm starting, which is they are able, if you give them a good iterate, they are very good at uh, uh, starting from there and, uh, and then finding better iterates. And there are some methods which, are, which have some advantages, but they have the drawback of not being very easy to initialize. But as far as the abstract uh, method I presented before is concerned, if you have a good iterate, it's usually a good thing. It can help you decrease computing time. And this happens in, uh, in uh, basically two situations. It's when you have to solve a similar sequence of problems. And the two situations where you have to solve a sequence of similar problems is either when you are resolving the same optimization problem time after time. So in my example of uh, the unit commitment problem, it's like that. Every day you have to choose the planning, the schedule for the coming days. And if the situation didn't change too much from yesterday to today, then probably two days, uh, sorry, sorry, yesterday's solution is probably a good starting point, point for two days optimization. So that's the first situation in which um, you have uh, good starting points. And the other one, it's branch and bound, which is the main method to solve combinatorial problems. Since I will skip this part of the lecture, you, I, I won't be able to come back to this later, later, but basically if you solve a combinatorial problem by branch and bound, you have your initial problem and you split it into sub-problems and then you split again and you, you generate a list of sub-problems. <coughs> and every time you, you solve a sub-problem, it helps you initialize the solution for other sub-problems, basically. So it's uh, the other situations where it's very uh, useful to use warm starting because you actually have a good iterate from something, a task you've solved before. Um, okay, I think I'm going to skip this also and go back to my idea of a local model. So again, you are the solver. You don't know all the details of the function you're minimizing and the constraint because this is hidden in the oracle and all you know is the evaluation of these functions at a, f a, uh, a set of particular points. So how from this can you uh, build your local model that will help you decide which x you should try next? The first idea is to, to just use the current evaluation of the functions and their gradient. So you're using the very, very general idea of linearization. Say, so, okay, my function f, I don't know it, but I know its value at the current x. I know the slope because I estimate the derivative, so this gives me gives me a linear approximation of my function. And you can do this for the constraints as well if you want. And then you end up basically with a linear program. Okay, it's a bit simplified, but... Uh, so that's the first idea. So what you're doing here is using only the current information at point x, your current iterate, you're just ignoring all the previous information that the, the oracle gave you for the previous iterates, and you build a linear approximation. Um, it's usually not an idea that you can use directly because let's assume that there is no constraint, for instance, your linear approximation will be like this, and it goes down to minus infinity. So if you just use your local model like this, probably you will take, a, your, either your problem will be unbounded, so this local model will not be helpful at all because it will tell you to choose as the next x a point which is infinitely far away, or even if there are some constraints that make the problem bounded below, it will probably get you to try points which are very, very far away and it's not going to be very efficient. So basically, when you use a tangent linear approximation as a local model, what people do is that they limit the step length and they have a rule such, such as, okay, I'm trusting the gradient of the function, but not I mean, just, just in the vicinity of where I'm, I have evaluated it. So I'm going to go in the direction that the gradient is pointing me, but not too far. So that's the first idea, and that it, uh, uh, it, you end up with the idea of what's called gradient descent, which is the most basic optimization 
uh, method and also <coughs> that should probably not be used in practice because it's just too simple. So I'm talking about it because it's the first idea that comes to mind, but you should not stop there in practice because there are many uh, good ideas that can be added to this first idea. Second idea is slightly more complicated. So let's say you trust your direction that the gradient is pointing you. You know that you shouldn't go too far because maybe it's going to uh, take you to infinity or something like this. Say, so, okay, uh, I'm going to line search. So I'm in a large space, n-dimensional. I'm going to restrict the function to the line, straight line, which is where the gradient is pointing. So you know you have to go in the direction that the gradient is pointing. You don't uh, want to go too far. Well, you're going to evaluate function f along these lines. So of course, not all along the line, because that's infinitely many points. But basically, you can try to take a step, and then a shorter and longer one, and then there are rules for this line search. And basically, if the line search was perfect, what you would be doing is to evaluate your function at a point, restrict it to a straight line, minimize it along this straight line, and this gives you the next iterate. That's the idea of a, of a line search, and obviously the one-dimensional sub-problem is not solved exactly in practice, so we have some approximate ways of solving it, and then we keep going. So basically the same idea as before, except that in gradient descent, usually you take uh, an arbitrary value for the step length, which, since it's arbitrary, is probably not very good. And here, you have a rule for choosing the step length in a clever way, so it's better. And then the third important idea is, okay, if I just have one iterate and I evaluate the gradient, I can't really do anything better than going in the direction of the gradient, okay? Or either in the direction of the gradient if I, if I want to maximize my function, or in the opposite direction if I want to minimize it. But basically, if, if all I have is an evaluation of function and gradient at one point, I can't do any better than this. But since the method is iterative, what you have is a lot of previous iterates at which you also have evaluated your functions and their derivatives, which means that you can try to use this as well. So the third idea is to use as a descent direction not the gradient, but some clever direction that takes into account all the information that you've gathered so far, which is um, the function evaluation and the derivatives at the previous iterates. So this yields you to what's called quasi-Newton methods, which are also a very big step in efficiency compared with the previous ID, two IDs where only the gradient was used uh, as the descent information. Basically what this is doing, and that's, why the, that's where the quasi-Newton name comes from, what this is doing is it's really emulating second order methods, so methods that are using evaluation of second derivatives, the Hessian matrix, as a functions, except that we only evaluate first order derivatives, gradients, so it's cheaper. So that's also a very important idea in continuous optimization. There are many ways to do this, okay, but I just presented you the main ideas. Okay, now as you have noticed, I've mostly or only talked about gradients. So what I did here is assuming that your oracle was returning the function and the first derivative, the gradient. Why did I do this? Well, Again, it's, uh, it is this because of uh, it's a uh, practical uh, know-how by uh, by uh, practitioners, which tells us this. So in practice, usually if you don't evaluate the derivatives at all, so it's let's say order zero, you just evaluate the functions themselves. The information you have about the function is very poor, so your local model will be very poor. Poor, so you will take many, 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 many iterations. So it's not a method that should be ruled out completely, but it's only for desperate cases where you, it's, it's basically impossible to get higher order derivatives. So in most cases, you really want to go from order zero to order one, is to say to find a way to evaluate the gradients. And again, in uh, practice, if you're using a modeling language, this will be done completely for free not for free, but let's say it will be done transparently for you by the modeler, because the modeler will use this automatic differentiation technique to generate the code that will evaluate both function and gradient 
and it will not cost you much more because it's just basically twice as expensive to compute both than to compute just the function. So uh, order one is really better than order zero. And then order two, so the Hessian matrix, is even better. But the problem is it's huge. Okay, it's, it's, the information is much larger, uh, which means that it will take you a lot of time to compute it and then to use it in your optimization process. So again, it, it's not an idea to rule out completely, but in many, many cases, we observe that uh, using the order two information don't, doesn't pay off. So you will take less iterations because your local model will be better, but it will be, it will be so costly to evaluate it and to use it in the optimization process that you will uh, end up increasing the computation time even if you're decreasing the number of iterations. And sometimes you're actually not even able to do it because you just have memory problems or I think like this, so it's not even doable to use order two information. So just, uh, you, you can do all three options, okay, but just a uh, practitioner's viewpoint on this is that uh, if you have to take a guess, uh, the guess is order one is probably the good option and that's the one you want to start with. Now I want to mention a few particular cases where this uh, very general method I described are not actually used. So these two cases are linear programming and to some extent quadratic programming, which is, uh, let's say, a bit particular, so let's ignore it for, for now. So linear programming is very structured, it, it's a very structured problem class, and there is um, a special method for it, which is the simplex method, so the very first one that was invented in the late 40s. So the simplex method doesn't really follow the model I explained to you. There is, no, there is not this notion of each rate and local model and so on. It's a very specific method for this very specific problem class. It terminates, so there is no, we don't have this issue of using a necessary stopping condition uh, like we have for, for general optimization. So it's, uh, uh, we take a finite number of iterations and we get to the solution. And, uh, and so that's why LP, the LP class linear programming is very special and doesn't really follow what I said before. Of course, it is still, it's a simple optimization class, a prime, but it's still a, an optimization prime, so you could use the general methods I presented before to solve LPs, it's possible, but since there exist a specialized algorithm for this class, usually that's the one you want to use, except for very, very, very large problems in, in which uh, experience shows that sometimes the dedicated algorithm, so the simplex algorithm, is actually less efficient than some generic continuous, continuous optimization methods. But so basically I just, want, just wanted to make sure you had in mind that the simplex method is very special and doesn't really follow the paradigm I described before. Okay, so now you have an idea of how this continuous optimization method works. They take iterates, the iterates are computed by building a local model of, the, func of the, the functions, which again the solver doesn't know, okay, this information is hidden in the oracle, so the solver only knows about the iterates at which you've evaluated the function and most probably or hopefully, let's say, its gradients. Based on this, you build a local model. This gives you a next iterate and then you go on and go on and go on and it, it gives you a list of iterates and every time you evaluate f, so f hopefully goes down and you minimize it and so on and so forth. The question is when do you stop? When do you stop this process? Well, to uh, answer this we have to go back to a little bit of math. So uh, about this necessary stopping condition, optimistic conditions. So again, the motivation is to stop your solver, your algorithm. Now, these uh, necessary conditions that I'm going to present you in a minute, basically what they are doing is that they are generalizing the idea that at the optimum, the gradient vanishes. So if you have a constraint-free problem, you have a continuous function like this, and you look at the solution, solution will be like a bowl shaped like this, and gradient will be zero at this point. That's pretty obvious. Now, this does not work if you have constraints. Um, we, 
we could draw uh, an example on this uh, blackboard there where you have a function which is okay it goes like this then you have a constraint here so the, opti the optimum is here and the optimum is at a point where the function the gradient of the function of the objective function is not vanishing okay it's uh, again pretty simple so what we are trying to do here is to generalize this, uh, this simple idea that at the optimum without constraints the gradient vanishes and it turns out we can do that but of course the new conditions will not be just about the gradient itself, it will be about the relationship between the gradients of the function, the objective function, and the gradients of the constraints. Um, okay, it's quite technical and I'm not going to go into the details and the technicalities, so I'm just going to present you the broad ideas and I will uh, cheat a little bit by, by hiding some technicalities in the process, but it's not very important at this point. So, let's look at it from the graphical viewpoint again. So let's say we have a linear equality constraint, A x equals, equals B. So we want x to be on this straight line here. And uh, so this is vector A, okay, perpendicular to the straight line. And we have a point x bar here, which is a candidate for optimality. So it's our current iterate, let's say. And we've evaluated the gradient of function f, it's like this. And the question is, is x bar a good candidate for optimality? The answer here is no. Why is it no? Because x is allowed to move along this line. Now, the gradient of the objective function is like this, which means that all these points on this line perpendicular to the gradients have an equal value for f. All the points on the right have a higher value, and all the points on the left have a lower value. Okay, it's the same thing as before. If I'm sliding my ruler like this perpendicularly to the objective function, I'm drawing the level sets of function f. So what I'm saying basically is that if I move back like this, I will get this point here, and this point here has a lower value for f, and it's still feasible, which means that this point x bar is not a solution because if I move it slightly in the direction, I will still have a feasible point and it will be better than x bar. So what you can see here is that the gradient of f cannot be like this. And for the same reason, it cannot be like this because then I would move my x bar point up upwards and it would still improve function f, so really the only option is that gradient, the gradient of f is like, is like this. So what we are discovering here on this simple example is that if x bar is an optimal solution, then the gradient of f must be collinear to the gradient of the constraint. That's the basic idea. Now this generalizes to nonlinear situations, so basically Let's say that function f now is nonlinear. Well, it was the same as before. When you replace uh, function f by its linear approximation, so it doesn't change anything. So it's easily it can be generalized to nonlinear situations, and it can also be generalized to situations in more than two dimensions. And you end up with something like this. You conclude that if x bar is optimal then the gradient of f, of f at x bar should be a linear combination of the constraints. So this linear combination, it's really the same thing as uh, in my uh, example here. Okay? When, I'm, when I say that a and the gradient of f should be collinear, I'm just saying that there exists a number. I don't know which number it is, but there is a number. Let's create, let's create lambda. So that a, or let's say gradient of f at x bar, plus lambda times a should be zero, okay? Which prevents situations like the one I have here because you cannot cancel out a and, and, uh, and the, gradient, the gradient of f at x bar in, on the picture I showed with any lambda because they're not collinear, okay? So what we are discovering on this picture, and again, it's uh, there are a lot of uh, complicated theorems about this, but uh, the main idea is 
almost obvious from a graphical viewpoint, which we, which we conclude from this, is that if x bar is optimal, then there should be a way to cancel out the gradient of f using a linear combination of the gradients of the constraints. And again, we don't know what the value of the uh, parameters should be in this linear combination, so the, lamb the lambdas, lambda, lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on. But they exist, if x bar is optimal. So these multipliers, they are called Lagrange multipliers. Uh, by the way, uh, some people, sometimes you can put a minus instead of plus there, it doesn't change anything because it's just a matter of uh, what, which sign you choose for the multipliers, so you, you can find both notations. And it's very important to understand that these multipliers are extremely important in the solving process. At first, it looks useless because all you want is x, okay? When we started the lecture, I was telling you that, okay, you have this optimization problem, and what you really want in the end is x, which is the decision variables. Which units should I start tomorrow, and at what time in my unit commitment problem? Well, actually, you will get both at the end of the solving process, x bar and the lambdas. So the lambdas, for one thing, they are a proof, okay, not a proof of optimality, but a proof that the necessary condition of optimality is actually satisfied. So you have a proof that your, uh, the x bar returned by the solver is not stupid. It, it, had some, it has some good chances of being optimal because it matches the, it satisfies the necessary inform, um, optimality conditions. And also, they return re very useful sensitivity information, which is what I'm going to talk about in a minute. Before this, let's generalize this to inequality constraints. Before, I was just, so when I showed this, I started from a 1D case with linear constraints. As I told you, you can generalize to nonlinear cases just by replacing f by this gradient. As I told you, you can also generalize to many constraints and uh, larger dimensions, not just two dimensions with one constraint. And now I'm adding one more uh, element, which is you can also generalize this to the situation where you have inequality constraints on top of the equality constraints. So, if you have inequality constraints, basically there are two cases. So, contrary to the equality constraints case, here you have something which is a, like a discrete choice, which is, is this inequality constraint active or not at the solution? So is it actually constraining or is it just not useful in the problem? If the constraint is inactive, that is to say, it's not binding at the optimum, then it's basically a useless constraint, which means you could remove it from the problem without changing the solution which also means that this constraint has nothing to do in the optimality conditions, because the problem would be the same without this constraint. So, based on this argument, we can say that the multiplier for an inactive constraint should be zero. It means that the constraint doesn't exist, basically. But, if this constraint is active at x bar, then we are basically going back to the situation of uh, equality constraints, so there is this relationship between the gradient of the constraint and the gradient of the objective. But the di difference is that the multiplier is signed, so you have to, not only to have a, a collinearity between the objective of the gradient and the objective of the constraint, but they have to be in the proper directions, which means that the multiplier has a sign. So basically, there are two elements. One is that the multiplier for an inactive inequality constraint is zero. And the second is that for an active inequality constraint, the multiplier has a sign, which sometimes we express it uh, in a very compact way like this. So it's a, bit, it's a bit difficult to understand, but it's very compact, so people like to write it like this. So lambda should be positive and non-negative. The constraint should be also non-negative. And they are orthogonal, which means that if uh, this is non-zero, then this is zero. So, but anyway, this is uh, just a tricky way to write it. The important thing to remember is that inactive constraints have a zero multiplier, and active constraints have a potentially non-zero but signed multiplier. So we end up with this uh, 
theorem, which is uh, called the uh, KKT conditions uh, from Karush, Kuhn, and Tucker, who I guess came up with this theorem first, uh, which tells us this. So if X bar is an optimal solution of a continuous optimization problem, plus some technical assumptions that I'm skipping right now, then several things. First, j of x bar is non-positive and x, h of x bar is zero. That's trivial. It's just we're just saying that if x is a solution, then of, of, obviously it's feasible. There is nothing interesting in the first line. This line tells us that then there exist multipliers. So lambda for the equality constraints and mu for the inequality constraints. Uh, yeah, I think the plus, plus should be here. So uh, until now, I was using lambda for the equality and mu for the inequality, and it just is the opposite here. Not very consistent. Anyway, so you have multipliers for inequality constraints, which are, which are unsigned, and you have multipliers for equality constraints, which are unsigned, and you have multipliers for the inequality constraints, which are signed. This line tells us that for inequality constraints, if the constraint is inactive, so the basically GI doesn't play any role in the solution, you could remove it, the problem would be the same. Then it should not play any role in the optimality conditions, which means that its multiplier should be zero. And then you have this. So you can there is a linear combination of the gradient of the function, objective function, and of the constraints of both types that cancels out. Again, it's just a generalization in the case we were both with both equality and inequalities of the very simple ideas I showed before, which is that if x bar is optimal, then the gradients of all functions cannot really do anything. They have to be aligned in such a way that you can't move x bar a little bit and get a solution which is both better and still feasible. It's just like this. So it's a uh, it's actually very simple if you look at it from the graphical viewpoint. Okay, so now we have our stopping condition. If x bar satisfies this, then you can stop your algorithm. Which also means that if you want this to be useful, you have to compute the multipliers along. Because if you just have a given x, you won't be able to check this because you don't have the lambdas, right? So the conclusion from this is that any decent solver will actually iterate both on x and lambda, so or on mu, so they will try iteratively new values of x, which is what you're looking for in the end, and also on lambdas, which are used to get the proof of optimality, even though it's not really a proof because it's uh, only necessary conditions. And then you know when to stop. You stop when the uh, KKT conditions, so these ones, are satisfied, satisfied, of course, up to some tolerance because you can't get this mathematical ideal in a numerical calculation. So this is uh, very widely true. And the counterexample, such as gradient descent, are not very convincing in, such a, in the following sense. So if you're doing gradient descent, you're not getting the lambdas. Okay? Gra gradient descent is just about iterating on the x. So what we can conclude from this is that you won't have any efficient way to stop such, such an algorithm because it's too uh, trivial and it doesn't compute the necessary information along its process to, to solve, to, to check the optimality conditions. And uh, accordingly, they're not very efficient. So good methods are always iterating both on x and lambda and they use this information to check the necessary optimality conditions. Now, that's, this should be uh, convincing you that uh, multipliers are really extremely important and useful because they help you stop your algorithm, but actually they are, they are even better than that. Uh, they can be interpreted as sensitivity information, which is what I told you in the very beginning when I was explaining the motivations for using optimization. I was telling you, okay, it's faster, it's automated, it will help you improve the value of the objective, it will help you improve constraint satisfaction, so it's all benefits. 
And also, I also said that optimization would give you some sensitivity information. That's where the multipliers come into play. So let's say we change a little bit our optimization problem. So what we did is instead of use, using j of x lower than zero, let's say it's lower than alpha, alpha being slightly positive or slightly negative. And same thing for the constraints. So what the constraints are telling you really is the limitations on what you can do with your variable. So if we go back to our factory problem, for instance, the limitation was that you had only nine hours a day of machine A and B. Now you might be wondering, wow, what if I could extend this to 10 hours? So I would give myself a little bit more of this resource that is constraining me, which is in this case machine time. Or conversely, what if I go to 8 hours instead of 9? Then how much money will I make, how much additional money will I make if I go from 9 to 10 hours? And how much money will I, will I lose if I go from 9 to 8? Well, that's exactly what multipliers are telling you, because it can be shown that the derivative of the value of the problem with respect to alpha is the multiplier, up to some sign, and the derivative of the value of the problem, so v here is how much, it's the value of this. So if you solve the problem with alpha and beta equals zero, you get some uh, profit, which was 10 euros in my example. If you solve it with 10 hours instead of 9, you will get maybe uh, 11 euros, something like this. So what I'm saying here is that if you look at how much money you will make and perturb slightly, so you change slightly the problem by allowing you a bit more or a bit less of the resources explained in the constraints, then the profit will change. And how much it will change is given by the multipliers. So what the multipliers are really is it can be interpreted very uh, in a very uh, intuitive way as a price. Why do I, what am I saying this? Because usually F is money, where you're minimizing your cost. And G or H are resources like time in our, in our example. And so this lambda is money by unit of constraints, by unit of time. So in this case, in the factory case, Lambda would be in euros per hour, and it will tell you how much money in euros you would make in addition if you have one more hour of machine, of, of machine time. So uh, these lambdas are actually very, uh, again, it, it seems like a mathematical artifact that's just being used in some uh, weird equation to check when to stop the algorithm, but it's not, it's not like that. It's, indeed useful to stop the algorithm, but you can also interpret this very uh, intuitively as the price of each of the resources that you've listed in your G and H constraints. And if you wonder how much you would gain by extending a little bit the resource, then this is what lambda is telling you, or mu. Okay, so it's, it's uh, it's, it's really a price in, in the sense of units of objective function you gain per unit of constraints you allow yourself in addition. Okay, that's it with uh, how continuous optimization work, works. Now what I want to do is uh, add a, just a little bit of uh, theory just seven more slides, so I'm going to skip this uh, talk about a bit about solvers for combinatorial optimization. I'm going to skip the one about unit commitment and just present you one last set of ideas, which is very important in optimization, and then uh, we'll move to the practical example. This last idea, which is also extremely important in uh, in the field of optimization is what we call duality. Duality is very much linked to the Lagrange multipliers and basically it's another way of looking at Lagrange multipliers. It's, uh, so, so far we have seen them, we saw them as these uh, numerical parameters that you have to put in your KKT conditions to actually prove that you have checked the necessary conditions of optimality. 
Now we're going to look at them from, from different perspectives, but it will be the same lambdas, okay? Just another viewpoint of these lambdas that will, uh, I think, both give you a better understanding of uh, what they are and also which uh, is very useful in practice because it, 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 when you look at the lambdas, not just as multipliers of the KKT conditions, but as elements of the duality theory, um, then it, it, yields, it yields new ideas about solving methods such as uh, the one I'm going to present in the last part of my presentation. Okay, so going back to uh, our initial problem, again, we're going to find x bar minimizing function f with constraint g and h. Fine. Let me introduce this very strange function, which is a function both of x, primal, primal variable, and lambda mu, the dual variables. So here is how I, I'm building my function. So I'm adding f and a linear combination of the constraints of inequality type and a linear combination of the constraints of equality type. So here you see a strong connection with the KKD condition because if I differentiated this, I would, I would get exactly this KKD condition. So KKD condition was at the gradient of f, the linear combination of the gradient of g, and the gradient of, of h. So I'm, you're already seeing a connection here, but it's not the same as before. Okay, I'm not considering a linear combination of the gradients. I'm considering a linear combination of the functions themselves. So this uh, strange function is called the Lagrangian of the problem. And it's really just the objective function perturbed by the constraints. So if I put zero here in the multipliers, I'll get exactly my objective function. And if I put uh, non-zero values, then it's my objective function tilted by the constraints. Now, why would I do this? It seems like a very uh, strange idea to do this. Well, the motivation for this is, is, is the following. So let's assume that you fix lambda and mu to some value. And you want to minimize the Lagrangian. So if you, going back to this, lambda and mu are fixed. And you just have a new function of x, which is the objective function, plus some perturbation linked with the constraints. And the, the idea is that we assume we can minimize that. We, minimi we minimize it without the constraint, of course. Okay, so. Uh, what we did really is that we took the constraint from, from the objective function, put it in, in the objective with these multipliers, and removed them from the constraints. We, we are really displacing the constraint, the g and h function, from the constraints to the objective. So when we do this, we get with this new, very strange problem. I'm, I'm saying very strange because it's not intuitive why we should do this, but I will explain to you in a minute why it's useful. So we, we now have a problem where the objective is apparently a bit more complex than before because we've added g and h to the initial objective function. But it's simpler than before in the sense that we've removed the constraints. Okay? We are now only minimizing basically without constraints. So x is in some subset, so we can't do anything about this, but we've removed the g and h constraints of the problem. So it's, very, it's a very different problem where the difficulty has been much decreased in the constraints, no more constraints. And maybe uh, the objective function is a bit more complicated, complicated than before because we've added some terms in it. Now, here is the really interesting thing. What can we tell? Assuming we, we can compute this, okay? We, we have the value, so lambda, this uh, theta function here, so the minimum uh, Lagrangian, is worth 5. What can we tell about the optimal value of the problem we are trying to solve, which is this one? Well, what we can say is that the optimal value, which we don't know yet, is larger than this value that we just computed. Okay? If you manage to solve this, so the idea is that this problem is simpler than the one you're tackling before. Okay? So you have changed your initial problem to something different and simpler. This simple problem tells you that 5 is a lower bound for the optimal value of the problem. 
So the reason for this is actually very simple. So again, if you take it from the mathematical viewpoint, you have complicated proof to write and so on. But really, the fundamental reason behind this is uh, pretty simple. So I can explain it to you in, a, in a, just in a few minutes. The idea is that this function that we just created Um, okay, it's, actually, I, I uh, got the inequality part wrong, wrong sorry, but the, basically, the, okay, let's ignore the inequality part for now. The idea is that this function is equal to f on the feasible subset, and its, it's, its value is something different, I don't know what, on the rest of the space. But if it, it doesn't matter what the function returns, so it's like when the function returns on the rest of the space. We used to have a problem on the restricted subspace where the objective was function f. And now we're creating a problem which is defined on the larger space. And the new objective function is still equal to f on the feasible subspace. And it has some other value elsewhere. Which means that if you minimize this new function, you will necessarily get a value which is lower than the value of your original problem, because either by pure chance you will end up with a solution which is feasible, and then it will be equal to the value of uh, objective function, f. And if you end up with a value which is elsewhere, then it will be lower than the value of the original problem. So basically what I'm saying is that we have a way to compute a lower bound for the optimal, for the original optimal problem. And of course, a lower bound is useful if it's high. Okay, see, if I told you that the, let's say for the factory problem, that the cost, to, I don't know how many items of X and Y types you should make, but my uh, duality theory told me that it will cost you at least minus 10,000 euros. Okay. Well, that's uh, equally useless. I mean, uh, I can truly tell you that uh, zero is a better lower bound. Okay, so a uh, good lower bound is a lower bound that's high because it's getting closer to the value you're looking for. And the interesting thing here is that when we computed our lower bound, lambda and mu, the multipliers, were arbitrary. Okay, we, choose, we chose a value, we assumed that for this value of lambda and mu, we could solve, we could minimize the Lagrangian, and this provides us with a lower bound. Now, we could try this trick with other values of lambda and mu, right? And we would get another lower bound because the Lagrangian would be different, so there is no reason to get the same lower bound. So we actually, what we have just created is a machine to generate lower bounds, and every time you input lambda and mu in your machine, it will get you a different lower bound. So of course, what you want to do is to find the value of lambda and mu that yields the highest possible lower bound. Which means that what you actually, what you would like to do, after you've had this idea of uh, of uh, the Lagrange function that helps you generate lower bounds, the next natural idea is to try to maximize function theta so as to get a lower lower bound which is as high as possible, that is to say, as useful as possible. And that's what optimal uh, duality is about. It's about maximizing theta which is computed by minimizing the Lagrangian. OK, so far it's, it's just theory. So in practice, I mean, at least in, in uh, let's say, in uh, numerical practice uh, from the computing viewpoint, this is useful only if you can solve, you can minimize the Lagrangian. And hopefully you, it has to be very fast, okay? because the idea is that you have your original problem, which is difficult, big, and so on, and you don't really know how to solve it. And you have this idea of using Lagrange, the Lagrange method. If solving the Lagrangian is very fast, then you can easily get lower bounds. And then you can, you can try other new values of uh, lambda mu and get better lower bounds. This all makes sense only if you can actually solve the Lagrange minimum problem quickly. But of course, it's, uh, it happens very often because when you removed functions g and h from the constraints, normally this considerably simplifies the problem. So it's not stupid to think that minimizing the Lagrangian will be much cheaper than uh, solving the original problem. Now there's still one uh, 
thing you can object to this, which is, uh, okay, your uh, nice theory provides me with a lower bound. Okay, so in a factory problem, it would be like, okay, I want to, the actually answer I wanted is, you should produce two items of the X type and two items of the Y type. What your theory, and, and this would provide me a pro, uh, profit of 10 euros. What your theory is telling me is that, yeah, I don't know how many items you should, should make, but I can tell you it will cost you, or, okay, it's a maximizing uh, problem, so it's, uh, it, you won't make a profit larger than 12. Okay, I don't care. I don't care that, uh, I should, that my profit will be lower than 12. I wanted to actually know which, how many items of X and Y you should do. So your theory is useless. You could say that. Well, that's wrong, okay? This mechanism is extremely powerful. Uh, the main reason for this is that this uh, theoretical thing I showed you is actually the basis for many practical methods. And the practical methods that solve continuous optimization problems are all, as I said, iterating both on X and lambda at the same time, and the way they iterate on lambdas are more or less inspired by this uh, duality theory. So the first reason for what, the first reason why duality is important is because it uh, it tells you how, in practice, to devise these continuous optimization methods that actually iterate both on X and lambda at the same time. The second reason is that in some cases. Uh, miracle happens, which is that this method that looks like it's only computing lower bounds is actually, <coughs> is actually solving the problem. Which means that if you have enough convexity, which again can be exp expressed clearly in, in terms of mathematics, then you will end up with a solution of the problem. So it's, it's really a miracle if you look at it this way. So you have your uh, optimization problem you completely remove the constraints G and H. You ignore them, they are never enforced as a constraint. You always put them in the objective. And then you iterate on lambda and mu. And at some point, uh, at some point, you have a clever value of lambda and mu, which has been uh, found by maximizing the theta function. And you solve this problem there is no constraint, okay, G and H are ignored, you just minimize this without G and H. And you minimize it, and what happens is that, by pure miracle, the X point that comes out of this is feasible and optimal. So, when you have enough convexity, you can, by, by using this me mechanism of duality, you can iterate on lambda and mu, find the appropriate value, and at last, when you have found the appropriate value, minimize this and get a point which is feasible. And again, you have never, never enforced the constraint anywhere in, in the problem. That's why I'm calling this a miracle. It's because you get the constraint enforcement for free when the, when the problem is convex. Okay, let's go back to this. So I was, that's the point I was making is that this method, which actually looks like it's providing you with useless information, sometimes actually solves your original problem. Of course, it's not a very common situation because you need some uh, strong assumptions, convexity assumptions. And uh, also, as I said before, it's, uh, it's a way to look at the multipliers differently from the KKD conditions. So it's, uh, from the mathematical viewpoint, we're always happy to make connections between different things. And in, in this case, we, the multipliers are a link between the KKT conditions and the Lagrangian. Anyway, so that's it about the Lagrange uh, theory and duality theory. And now we are ready to turn to this ADMM method, which uh, will be the, uh, the object of my last, uh, the last part of my presentation, where I will apply this method to uh, uh, polar grid problems. Okay. Okay, so last set of slides. Uh, two parts. So the first part is about uh, the smart grid, power grids. So I'm assuming here that uh, you are probably more from the IT, in a wide sense, community 
than from the electrical engineering community, so maybe it's uh, useful that I give you a few hints about how the power system works and how uh, they are evolving today. It will be the first half of the presentation. And then we'll be able to turn to the second part, which is the uh, application of optimization to a particular problem in the in the power system and uh, power systems. Okay, so I, I guess I'll take the break after this first part, and we'll keep that for the very last uh, last uh, session. Okay, so first thing is that um, when I say smart grids, I really mean smart distribution grids. So the way the power systems are organized today, we usually distinguish three elements. So generation, pretty obvious, it's units that produce power. And then the network is divided into the transmission network and the distribution network. It's just all the same in, in the sense that it's uh, transformers and lines and so on. So you could say it's just one network, but we usually distinguish between the two because there are many different technical choices and, and things like that which, which make them read two different systems. So the transmission system is uh, the large uh, towers, transmission towers that you see, so it's made of metal like this, like it lo looks like the Eiffel Tower. It's big, uh, it carries power uh, at voltages which are usually, uh, so in France it's at least uh, 63 kilovolts and up to 400 kilovolts. In some countries, uh, usually in a, where you have larger distances to cover, you can go to 1 million uh, volts. So it's, it's a big infrastructure. Um, it's meshed, so it's a network in which we have redundancy in the sense that f you can go from one point to another using different paths. And this is very important because if one line is lost, which may happen because you have a fault on the line, so it could be anything, really a short circuit, uh, so there are many reasons why the line could be uh, damaged. If you lose the line, uh, the po power will automatically reroute using other lines, and none of your customers will experience a blackout. And it's a very important property of the transmission system because it, uh, it means that it has high reliability, but it's also, um, and it's important because of course uh, uh, a blackout on the transmission system would impact a huge number of customers, so you really want it to be redundant and reliable. But it also means that it's very costly. So the obvious reason is that you have to put more equipment to have a redundant network, but it's not the only reason. So in addition of having more lines if you want it to be redundant, you will also increase the complexity of protections, so how uh, breakers operate. You will increase the complexity of supervision. So it, there's a lot, lot of problems that come up when you build a meshed power system. And that's why we only do it for the that's the bulk infrastructure, so this is high voltage system, and we create a transmission system. And then on this system, you have two types of nodes. So it's, a, it's like a, a big graph that covers the entire country, and actually the entire continent. And you have two types of nodes. So some nodes are injection nodes, that's where your big generators will inject power. And some nodes are withdrawal nodes, which we call primary substations. And at this node, you have a step-down transformer that uh, brings down the voltage to, in the front, it's usually 20 kilovolts, so it's much lower. It's more or less the same level in Italy and other countries. So it's, that's what we call medium voltage. And from there, power is dispatched through these medium voltage lines and then stepped down again into low voltage lines to customer. This part is radial. Okay, there is no redundancy, which means that if you experience a uh, some damage on the line, all the customers will have a blackout. On the other hand, it's much cheaper and simpler to operate. So that's why in the entire world people have chosen to distinguish between the transmission system which serve many many customers and we pay the extra cost of redundancy and the distribution system which is just the last part of the uh, delivery chain, I would say, supply chain. And since it's the very last part, if it fails, you will only put a few hundred or thousands of customers in the dark. And this is acceptable if it doesn't last too long. And so 
we prefer doing this rather than uh, paying the extra cost of having a redundant system like for the transmission system. Now, the transmission system is, I mean, it has undergone a lot of investment so far and it's already monitored very efficiently. We have control rooms where they supervise everything that's uh, going on in the transmission system. So it's already quite smart in the sense that we have plenty of equipment to, to know what's going on and measure things and compute things and a lot of automation also. So when a fault happens, you have automated decisions that uh, make the appropriate corrections to the system. So this is very, really very advanced. And by, uh, to the contrary, the distribution systems has been the object of much less uh, investment in terms of uh, measuring and supervision and things like this until today mostly because the distribution system is so large and so complex and, and, and it has many ramifications and branches and so on that if we did anything complex with it it would be a ni nightmare to maintain and to operate uh, just because it's so big i mean uh, if um, in France, for instance, the transmission system, or the, the distribution system, is 50, 15 times longer. So it's about than the, than the transmission system. So transmission system is about one uh, one hundred thousand kilometers, which is already quite a big number. And the distribution system is one point five million kilometers of cables and lines. And also, the transmission system has a simpler structure because one line. It's a big line. It's like it, it could be 300 kilometers of, of uh, just going from point A to point B. Now, 300 kilometers of distribution line would not look like one line. It would look like one short line, then branches, then short line branches and so on. So the distribution system is much longer, much more complex in its structure, and it's never been uh, considered until today a good idea to do anything very advanced in this system, which means that you have on one hand the transmission system, which is heavily uh, monitored and, uh, and uh, with all the measurements and telecoms and so on. And on the other hand, you have the distribution system on which not, on which not much really is done today in terms of, of supervising and acting on the system. OK, so that was the first part of the, the introduction. And the second part is about congestion. So you have this network and it's there to deliver power. To some level, there is a, an analogy with uh, with a transmission, with a sorry, telecommunication network, which is there to deliver information. And you also have a notion of congestion in telecoms, but it's not really the same. So in, yeah, I'm not a uh, total telecoms expert, but I guess that when a telecom network is congested, it means that some information in, is, is lost and you cannot really deliver it to the final destination. In a power system, a congestion is different, so there could be essentially three types of congestions. So one is what we call an overload. It's pretty simple. You draw too much power through your equipment. Equipment meaning either a transformer or a line. And because you're drawing so much power through it, it heats. Now the heat, of course it's losses, so it's money you have to pay, so it's a financial problem. But it can get much worse than this because if this heat is excessive, the equipment will be damaged. Second type, type of uh, congestion is under voltage. So this basically the idea is that if you are uh, if you are uh, a consumer, and you consume power. By consuming power, you will actually lower the voltage. And the more you consume, the more the voltage drops. So these plugs are supposed to be 220 volts, I guess. But if you take your meter and measure the voltage, it will be different. You will have something between minus 10% and plus 10% of the nominal value. So it could very well be 240 volts or uh, just 200 volts, something like this. The reason for this is basically that if you consume power, voltage drops. And if you inject power, voltage rises. Now, the reality is a bit more complex than this, but it's a basic idea that can, you can remember. And this is what a congestion is, is either excessive current overload 
Um, voltage that's too low or voltage that's too high. Now, why is this a problem? So there can be different consequences. So the first one is from the user viewpoints. It's uh, your appliances could malfunction. So if your, volt your appliances are designed by manufacturers to work at 220 volts, more or less, with some, some margin, if you try to feed them with just 150 volts, most of them will not work anymore. So it depends, of course, so if you have just uh, elect electrical heating, which is just a basic resistance, it will work with any voltage. But if you're thinking of a more sensitive load, like a TV, for instance, Changes are, if you try to power your TV with 150 volts and the designer of the TV designed it for 220 volts, the TV will not start. Okay, so that's the kind of malfunctioning that happens when you have under voltage situations. Now, if you have over voltage, it's uh, even worse because your equipment can be damaged and also maybe not work. But most importantly, uh, the damage could be permanent. So. If you have if voltage is too high, usually people start having uh, lights, the light bulbs that burn more quickly, and then other things can happen if the over voltage is really too high. Then, from the viewpoint this time of the grid operator, so not the customer anymore, but the distribution system operator, you also can experience fast aging or destruction of your grid equipment. So that's what happens in case of overload. You have your transformer or your line, too much power flows through it, it heats, it heats, it heats, it burns. So um, that's why we don't want congestions of the overload type on the network itself. And then, of course, if your equipment burns, not only will you lose the equipment, but also you will black out your customers. So the fourth type of issue is that this uh, congestion may end up in, in uh, cutting power completely for customers. That's what congestion is. Now, why am I telling you all this? Basically, because uh, if you look at the difference between the transmission system, high voltage, heavily monitored, and the distribution system, medium and low voltage, and without much uh, supervision today, there is a complete different difference in how congestion are handled. Um, in the distribution system today, what we do is we consider that there is no action possible on the customers. So you, you, cannot, do some, you, you cannot do such thing as having a congestion, measuring it, okay, oh, uh, there is an overload there, I'm going to ask these customers to consume less power. Okay? First, you don't know that there is a congestion because you don't have the monitoring equipment. And even if you knew there was a congestion, you cannot ask customers to consume less because these consumers, cons these consumers are purely passive. So they do what they want, they start switch, switch on, switch off the light, and they don't care what the DSO needs. A DSO meaning a distribution system operator, so it's the company that operates the network. So, b both because the consumer are completely uncontrollable, and because anyways you cannot know if a constraint is happening on the distribution system, what we do today is we use what people call the fit and forget uh, method, which basically consists in estimating beforehand what the largest possible power flow can be in your network. And then you build what I call pipes, pipes being a force, where there is no pipe in a power system, but pipes is a generic name for lines and transformers, so any equipment that has power flowing through it. So you have to size the pipes in such a way that congestion will just not occur. Okay? Because if they do, you won't be able to know they are there and you won't be able to act against them. So the, uh, the only way to, to, to go in this situation is to estimate what the worst loading will be in the future and build the pipes large enough so that these pipes are larger than the largest power flow flowing through them. This is extremely demanding because there are various reasons for this, but okay. Uh, if you are a grid operator, you are, let's say, putting a new transformer. 
First, you have to consider that this equipment will be there for at least 40 years. And if it can last for longer than this, 50, 60, 70 years, even better. Which means that the worst loading condition could happen in 50 years, and in 50 years, maybe the load will have, will have grown. Okay? So typically, you will have to put a transformer which is much larger than your current needs, because you have to anticipate for the future needs, which are in a very, very long time. Then uh, you also have to consider uh, what's, um, let's say, some kind of redundancy in the sense of distribution systems. So the idea is that, again, we don't want to put parallel lines in operation at the same time, because uh, that's too complex and costly. But we do have, um, we, we, we still want to bring power back to customers quite quickly after a fault. And the way to do this is to bring back power with uh, lines which are exist so it's like a backup line which is existing but not used in uh, uh, in normal operations and when there is blackout you use this uh, secondary line now when you do this the backup line is really you, you have much less power on the secondary line than on the main line which means that you have to design your network to work even when the secondary line is used so uh, basically what I'm saying is that when you're sizing your transformer, you have to think of the worst case, both in terms of the next 40 or 50 years, but also in the terms, in the terms of uh, maybe there will be a fault elsewhere, and I will not be feeding my customers with a, with a normal line, but with a backup line, which is not as uh, powerful as the main line. And also, you could think that maybe uh, it would be really, really, really cold, and in a country like France, it makes a big difference because there is a lot of electrical heating. So basically, what you're doing is that you're thinking of the most horrible uh, circumstances that could add up and put you, in, put you in a situation where the load has grown for many decades and you lost your main line and it's really cold and then that's how you want to solve you, that's how you want to size your equipment. If you do this, you will have two problems. First one is that you will build huge pipes, so it's expensive, so that's bad from the economic viewpoint. And the second uh, problem is that even after doing this, you, you've just estimated the worst case situation, but you don't really know what's going to happen in practice. Maybe you're wrong in your estimation, so maybe congestion will still occur in spite of the huge pipe you've, you've uh, built. So if you look at it from a graphical viewpoint, it's like this. So you have time here. It's a, of course a very uh, abstract uh, drawing. Okay. You have time here, and here you have, let's say, uh, capacity use is a usage of the network in blue, and you have the maximum capacity of your equipment, for instance. And what happens today is that since you have to build a very large pipe you have a lot of unused capacity most of the time. And if you're unlucky and got your estimation wrong, maybe sometimes, not often, but sometimes, you will actually have a congestion in spite of all the efforts you put in building this huge piece of equipment. So that's not a very uh, satisfactory situation. And what we're trying to do in the smart distribution grid is a new model, which will be a bit like this. So we get rid of the former assumptions according to, we, according to which it's impossible to act on the network and to monitor the network. So the reason for this is that today there are more and more loads, or even generators, like PV generators, which are flexible. What does it mean to be flexible? It means that from the generator's viewpoint, uh, if you have a PV panel on your roof, if I ask you to stop generating power for two hours because it's very sunny, all your neighbors are generating also at the maximum power, and it's holidays, so nobody's here to consume, and so you have to export a lot of power to the main grid, and this is overloading my transformer, then if these generators could lower a bit their generation, all it would cost them is some loss of gain. Okay, so you can compute that, so I, let's say I cut half your power for two hours, okay, that's uh, two euros. Uh, if you want, I can give you this two euros, it's very cheap. So a generator is very flexible in the sense that changing the power schedule of a generator 
doesn't really cost any loss of comfort to, to customers. And for the loads, it's a bit more tricky because of course there are loads that you really can't control. I mean, uh, if you can't control a TV, people want to start TV now because their favorite TV show is, start, is starting. If the network is sending them a signal such as, please start your TV in two hours, it's better from, from, for us because you're overloading the system, of course people will, have, will uh, suffer from a lot of discomfort and that, that's obviously not a viable option. And what I'm saying here is that we're also seeing new loads arriving in the system which are both a challenge because they are drawing a lot of power, so they are causing congestions, but also an opportunity in the sense that they have more flexibility than previous loads like TVs. And when I say, when I, the load I'm really thinking of when I'm saying this is electrical vehicles. Because electrical vehicles again are a challenge because especially if they have uh, fast charging uh, stations, they will draw a lot of power on the system, much, it's much worse than a TV. But on the other hand, um, they are really, really flexible in the sense that what people really want is the battery, the car battery to be charged tomorrow by let's say 7 a.m. That's when they're going to work. They don't really care whether the battery will be recharged between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. or between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. It doesn't really matter to them. Which means that there is some opportunity there to level the charging of electrical vehicles and to prevent the situation that would happen today. If, if today people were starting to buy lots of electric vehicles, probably what they would do is come home at 7 p.m. after work, charge them. They would do that, all of them. And 7 p.m. is already the peak, at least in France, not the case in, case in all systems, but in France, the daily peak is typically at 7 p.m. because everybody gets home and starts cooking and this and that. So the daily peak is at 7 p.m. and we would increase this daily peak with all the electrical vehicles that come for charging at the same time. And what would be a more, much more clever way to do things would be to postpone the charging of these vehicles and make sure that they do not increase the load at the time where it's already maximal. So that's why I'm saying that electrical vehicles are an interesting load, both in terms of challenge and opportunities. And then, um, storage, it's a bit more prospective, but there are some indicators that maybe storage, electrical storage, like batteries, I mean stationary batteries, not batteries inside vehicles, but batteries that you would put there and leave there, that batteries maybe will be used in future power systems. And the reasons I'm uh, saying this is, uh, okay, for one thing, the price of batteries is dropping continuously and experts from the battery fields are forecasting price drops that will keep going, um, I mean, they are really going down with, uh, uh, and it's making them much more, more and more interesting for applications because they are cheaper. And the other reason is that uh, batteries that are used for cars, electric vehicles, um, will maybe generate a second-hand market for batteries because if a battery loses maybe 20% of its capacity, people will consider they are too damaged for use in cars, but they still have 80% of the capacity remaining. And so there could be a second-hand market of taking batteries outside of cars and making stationary batteries out of them because they still have some useful life ahead of them, not just in the mobility sector, but for stationary applications, maybe it will be it will make sense to use them. So these drivers here make it plausible that in the future there will be some stationary batteries in the distribution systems. And of course, a battery is a purely flexible device. I mean, there is no consumer behind it, so it's not like a TV where if you uh, if you defer the TV load, it's a lot of discomfort for the user, so you can't really do that. A battery is a purely utility system, and it's just there to be charged and discharged when it's useful, and it doesn't cause any discomfort to anyone because there is no customer behind it. So these three categories, P PV generators, electrical vehicles, and maybe storage, are actually flexible, and this is very new because in the previous distribution systems, we had no flexibility. And the other novelty is communications. Uh, until a few years ago, we had absolutely no communication links with the distribution customers. 
Now uh, we have first, let's say, uh, general purpose communication channels which are becoming ubiquitous, so they are everywhere and cheap. And also we have some dedicated communication channels which is uh, in the process of being installed in France, which is the smart metering channel, which in the first place, of course, is just there for billing. So the reason why we install a communication channel between the utility and the meter is just because we want to cheaply measure consumptions to be able to send people a bill. It's cheaper than to send people manually read mirrors like we used to do. But on top of this, since we have this communication channel, which is there for billing purpose, we can use it for other purposes. So we're seeing all these new general purpose communication networks, plus the specific new channel, which is PLC in France for smart metering. And we start thinking, and also, yeah, by the way, smart meters are both a communication channel. And it's also, at the same time, it's a sensor, because the smart meter measures voltage power and so on, so it's a really uh, all-in-one system that provides you both the monitoring that you didn't have and the communication that you didn't have either to send back uh, curtailment orders to your flexible customers. So the conclusion of this is that we are moving towards a world where there will be the option to deal with congestions actively, which is why I, I call it an active distribution grid. So we would have to move from the current fit and forget model where you build huge types and then pray that nothing, hap nothing happens to a world where the pipes could be less oversized and so you, you are basically de deliberately waiting for the conditions to happen. You know they will happen, but when they happen, then you measure it and you act against it. And if you do this, then you will have some better asset utilization so you don't have all this unused capacity most of the time, and also if conditions happen, you will prevent them, so you, you, you are gaining reliability. So if I go back to my previous uh, uh, graphic, it's like this. So compared with the previous situation, you will lower comparatively the capacity of the network, which means that it will cost, cost you less money and the capacity will be better used. That's what I, that's what I called asset optimization. And then when people would normally, if not controlled, when they would overload the network, you will send them curtailment orders. So you will measure the congestion because you have no, now you have sensors and you will send them curtailment orders because you have a communication channel with them and they have flexible load. So it's a lot of new assumptions, okay? You need um, monitoring, communication, and uh, flexible loads. And so they will modify the load curve and they will go just below the new capacity. And, uh, and uh, because, because they do this, you will get both, both the economic gain and the reliability gain. Now, um, this all looks good. There are, of course, many issues. Uh, in terms of techniques, of course, it's much more complex. For so DSO, again, it's a distribution system operator. It's a company that operates a network. The situation today is costly because all or because of all these uh, large investments we have to make. But it's at least simple. And simplicity is very important when you have 1.5 million kilometers of lines to operate. In the new world I'm envisioning, uh, you will have all these sensors and communication and so on, which will be a lot of complexity in addition on a very large system. So uh, it's, I mean, we have to make sure that the costs are worth it. And they, the costs do not uh, overbalance the benefits. And also, there are many issues which are not technical, which is we, we need to change completely the contracts between the DSO and the customers, and we need new regulations. And there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, lawyers' work, I would say, that's been done uh, in the area of power systems, and everything is uh, very organized. There are rules for everything, and you have to change a lot of these rules. So. It looks like something is, is just changing uh, laws. It's very easy. You just have to do this. But uh, that's, as engineers, that's how we see it. But if you talk to people who work in the regulation area, it's actually a tremendous work to change all these existing contracts and regulations that are already existing. OK. And um, actually, so if I go back to this uh, 
technical question. Uh, question is, can we make it work? And also, can we make it work without causing a data deluge on the, on the operator? Uh, the reason I'm asking this is today, there is, of course, some flexibility in the network, just not on the distribution network. The flexibility is on the generation, generation part, so you can <coughs> produce more or less power with all your uh, units. And there is also, to some extent, some flexibility on the transmission system. But this, altogether, are maybe a few hundred of resources for a country, country like France, which means that today, the transmission system operator has about 10 control centers for the whole of France, and for, from these 10 control centers, they control a few hundreds of uh, actuators, like uh, increasing the power output of a given uh, coal generator or something like this. Now, we're talking about a system where you have literally millions of actuators. If you consider the uh, PV generators themselves, just, just this, that's 300,000 uh, units just for France. If you add to this electrical vehicles and, and uh, any kind of flexible loads that you can imagine, that's millions of resources. So of course it's not all the same to control such a large system and controlling a uh, smaller system that we're doing today. And what I'm saying here is that today, the control system is very centralized, which is a good idea and it works well, because it's a small system. So these 10 control centers which have a central supervision and control over these few hundred units, um, work using a purely centralized paradigm. And the question is whether we can find a new paradigm for a system where we are doing more or the same thing, except that the number of devices is hugely increased. And my viewpoint on this is that probably uh, the centralized method is not the proper one, just because we can't imagine a um, uh, centralized control center which will deal with so many resources. And so basically there are various other architectures possible. You can do something which is more hierarchical or today I'm going to talk about distributed uh, architectures. So. It's nearly 12. I, I suggest we take a very short break and uh, then we'll uh, move on with the last maybe 40 minutes of the presentation. Okay? okay. Thank you.